This is this is this is. Awesome. Still over in uh, still over in Washington. Yeah, I'm here in Bremerton, Washington. So yes, cool. Steve, where are you uh, where are you calling from? I'm not too far from you. I'm over in Calgary. Calgary, yeah, I love Calgary. Yeah, we uh, we did a couple nights there. Last time we were in Canada, actually, was Calgary, and we did Dickens Pub two nights. Uh, I was there. Oh, okay, excellent. Yeah. yeah, man, we had a good time. Good town. So, how long you yeah, been Calgary's there? Good. How, how long you I've been, been here? My I've been here my whole life. Right on. I've been to a lot of places, but never really moved anywhere other than the city. So I keep coming back here. I guess it must be the mountains or something. Yeah, I think you know. And you do you have family in the area too? Yeah, yeah. yeah I've got immediate family here and all that. So yeah, that, it helps. That's definitely something that I that I realized after touring the world is like there's so many great places, places I love to yeah. visit, and places that I wouldn't mind living if I had to. But but yeah. given the choice, I I really like my hometown. I like my home area. Um, back and forth, of course, to Texas, but now and again, but that's my wife's, you know, home, yeah. home state. So cool. we, you know, it means a lot, I think, to be near family. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I've got a brother and sister and parents still here and we're all kind of close and everybody's got kids. So it's a little, uh, mini football team of cousins sort of, uh, live within, you know, a few couple, a couple of miles of each other. So yeah, it definitely keeps you around here. That's good. Well, you guys have been around a long time, 95 Mm -hmm. uh, with a little hiccup, you know, s somewhere along the way, 2005 or so. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Second year hiccup, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, how did, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely heard of Belvedere. I've seen you guys play, kind, you know, at festivals in, mm. in passing a little bit. But, but um, you know, now that I've, you know, had you on the podcast, I went back and I started listening to, to the stuff. And, man, you guys are probably, I don't know, maybe the fastest punk band in the world. Is that... <laughs> Is that a thing? I don't I don't know. I don't know if we are anymore as we hit our mid 40s. I'm not sure how fast we still are, but you know, we don't we don't sit there counting the beats per minute. Well, actually no, we do. We actually still <laughs> beat, beat the BPM. Um, but yeah, you're right. We did run into each other a few times on Warp Tour back in the well, at least the late 90s or the early 2000s, I can't remember, but yeah, it's um it is a blur, isn't it? It is. It is. But uh, you know, it's great to see you guys back with this new album, your 6th album. Um, Thank you. We'll talk all about it, but I feel like I feel like you guys are f as fast as ever. You know, it's super fast. It's uh, energetic. It's melodic. Uh, where do you want to start? I mean, we could start. We could start at the beginning, but I kind of want to start with this new album because you guys have had a, a new chapter since around 2012. You guys came back. Mm -hmm. I, I think we should just kind of start there. Um, yeah, I'm good with that. Yeah, I feel like the new stuff is probably something I'd like to talk a little bit more about. Certainly got better over the years, so I think I'd probably like to talk about the later stuff. <laughs> I think so. I think so because uh, you know, I know from personal experience you 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 live a little bit more life, you maybe analyze what you've done in the past. You of course are influenced by what pe people are doing around us, but I feel yeah. like we get better as we go. We get better we, we more tries, more mulligans, yeah. right? Yeah, and I think you know, as you know, what it's like going through the you know you the album cycle and the touring, and you got to get another record out. And it's it's a little different when you're a little older and you kind of can do things on your own time. You got kids, you got families, and you make a record when it feels good to have it come out versus you know making a deadline or or whatever. So I, I feel like that's where we're at right now. It's it's sit around and make sure it's refined until it's ready to go. If you don't mind, take us through take us through getting back together to that 2012, 2013. You guys put a, a new record together, and then uh, we'll get into into great detail into the newest album. But uh, I want to sure. I want to hear how you came to now from yeah. So we we split in 2005, and we did a little series of shows in Canada, and you know I kind of thought that was it. Um, but then very shortly afterwards, my, a friend of mine, John and I, we, uh, we ended up, um, with Graham from Belvedere. We started a band called, this is a standoff. And, you know, we toured, we did three, ended up doing three albums. I think we toured Europe about well, at least seven or eight times in Japan and South America. And it slowly became this, you know, it's funny how you kind of go, you start out something going, Oh, this will just do this for fun. I start to realize I don't really do bands for, you know, just to play the local watering hole. I tend to like to to get out there so um right. you know that was that's really what what kind of filled the gap between when belvedere broke up and when we got back together again in 2012 so belvedere got back together in 2012 
we were just going to do a dozen, um, you know, a dozen shows. Uh, we did, we had Gros Rock, uh, we did Paris and then we did some, some, uh, Canada shows and we, we did a tour with, um, with Les and Jake down in Brazil. And I thought that was it. And then things went really well. Like, <laughs> so I, maybe that the absence makes the heart grow fonder for our fans, but you know, we were sort of selling out bigger venues than what we were used to. And, uh, so I was like, well, let's see how, you know, maybe we'll do one more show. <laughs> you know, maybe we'll do a couple more, right? This is actually going pretty good. Um, and then three years of that, and we put out, uh, decided we should probably put out some real, real music again, as opposed to just sort of riding the, uh, the old days. So that's great. That's yeah. great. So, I mean, talk about this new record. Uh, hindsight is the sixth sense. You have, mm-hmm. you have a, 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 you know, a clever way of putting, uh, your last album was something about the fifth. We plead the, what was it? Yeah. <laughs> Revenge of the fifth. Revenge yeah. of the fifth. <laughs> yeah. Star Wars fans. Right. And then the, uh, the old one was, uh, was fast forward to the tape, not the way you should spell for, but you know, we, we did start to see a little bit of a trend. The, the album titles in itself, I grew up listening to SNFU. So of course the seven sil or the seven word titles really resonated with us. So pretty early on in the mid nineties, we started doing five words, six syllable, uh, albums. And so that's our little format that we like to sort of stick with now. But um, now we're throwing a number scheme in, in, in it as well, just to sort of add to the, uh, you know, to the album title uh, fun. So it's important to have these like themes and these like recurring nuggets or uh, what do they call them? Easter eggs. In Easter way. eggs. I do love a good Easter egg. <laughs> what, what, uh, what, what inspired the Easter egg thing or just doing the, the album? Was it? Well, just NF, SNFU, basically, that, just like yeah, that yeah, kind of. We, we put I, our first record ninety six, and I think our next one came out around ninety eight or ninety ninety nine, and it just worked out that the second one was the same format. We're like, oh, that's awesome. So then for the third one, we're like, well, let's just keep this going, okay. and that was it. Okay, it was but, an know, accident. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's funny. You kind of think like you know, there's some big thing around it, but it's generally just oh, someone just came up with something. We said cool because nothing. There was no better ideas out at the time. I see, I see numbers like all the time. Like, um, like when I look down, it'll be 11, 11, it'll be yeah. like 10, 10 or nine, you know, there is no, like, but whatever it is, like it, that happens all the time. And, and after, after a while you start thinking like, am I supposed to be like paying attention to this? Like, yeah. And then the more you pay attention to something, the more you see in yeah. your everyday life. So yeah. it's kind of one I of those thinking. things. I keep thinking, let's buy a lottery ticket, but it never works out. I buy it, but I don't win. <laughs> it's all luck. It's all just it's circumstance all and, and numbers, right? Data? Yeah. The bigger the data, the easier it is to predict what's mm. going to happen, which you is weird, it. which is strange. So let's talk about the record. I mean, um, it starts out, it's fast right away. It's... I. I the way I would describe it, sort of being new to your band, I would, it's like Canadian, obviously, because you guys are Canadian. <laughs> but Canadian thrash skate punk mo- slash melodic metal. like Because mm-hmm. it does get into like metal parts and stuff. Uh, of course, the singing isn't metal at all. It's, it's, it's melodic punk, pop punk. Uh, ultra frat, fast breakneck speeds. Um, and then, yeah, I did write down fastest band in the world, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you listen to a lot of thrash bands, there's probably lots that, that are that are quite a bit quicker. But um, yeah, we definitely try to keep above 200. I think you, we're just still trying to prove that in our 40s we still still got it. Maybe so. That's why you you you, you kick off those albums with the Ripper, and then you get into the the more obscure stuff. You know, to take people through a bit of a journey. How did you get into the technical end of playing guitar and writing those those riffs? Because I it's was pretty really, crazy, some of those parts. Yeah, and like I don't take credit for like the solo stuff. I'm the singer, so I, I do the rhythm stuff, and I just try to keep up. But, um, you know, throughout the history, the, there was a lot of influence. There was some jazz influence. There was some metal influence. There was a whole bunch of, you know, sort of early um, 80s hardcore. And um, it all we all just kind of mashed it into one. I mean, I remember that RKL was a really big sort of standout to us. Okay. I remember we, we used to tour the States a lot do these sort of basement show tours for like 50 days or some, some crazy like that. And we picked up on, on an RKL live video and that just like kind of blew our minds. And, you know, we, we had SNFU to grow up with. 
and it just really sort of, I think, kind of carved a path. You know, bad, the bad religions and the no effects were kind of always there. But we kind of got, we did, definitely did a bit of a right turn when we started hearing, um, you know, RKL and, and sort of, of course, the SNFU influence as well. So, um, yeah, then you throw in all the other influences and, and that's kind of, you know, you spit it out and that was us. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah, I guess you could, you could say like it's all relative to what you're used to hearing. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I was thinking back, you know, suicidal tendencies and uh, mm-hmm. DRI, those are really the only thrash bands I really kind of were was listening to as a kid, you know, and then everything else was like Black Flag and yeah. know, Henry Roll- Rollins band, which is super slow, which yeah. is funny, you know, that kind of got me into punk. And then I started listening to Descendants and mm-hmm. uh, Doughboys. I really like the Doughboys from Canada. Yeah, they were so good, man. That, I'm glad you brought them up. That was... Uh, you know, that was another band that really made me think about like harmony and melody. And um, yeah, like I remember hearing Shine on like the radio and I was just like, this is amazing. Like, yeah, so good. So good. So melodic. And mm-hmm. the recordings even felt live. They had an energy to them. You know, it was cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so I guess, you know, all those influences obviously led you to like writing these songs. How do you guys put these songs together? Because they're going back to the technical question mm-hmm. you know you're, you're not wanting to take too much credit for the solo stuff but like still how do you you have to kind of figure out how to put lyrics and melodies over these yeah. these chunky guitar parts and yeah. is there you know i know you can play most of it live is there some stuff mm-hmm. that you're like okay i could barely play that and sing or what's the yeah thing? yeah <laughs> that is my biggest challenge you know it's not so much the writing and i mean it's a collaborative effort like everybody writes in the band and everybody is very good at what they do and that's what I love more than anything is, you know, it's a real sort of holistic attitude, especially with this new record, um, is that everybody is sort of left to sort of put their parts together and everybody just kind of nudges each other back and forth and finds the sweet spot. Um, but yeah, that is my challenge is to not write things that I can't sing and play. Um, and that's a TBA right now because I'm still working on some of that stuff to play it live. Um, yeah. You know, but um, but I love that challenge too, you know. I, I don't want to, I, I always want to get better. I always want to become a better singer. I always want to become a better player. And if that little fire of being scared that I'm not going to be able to play that live pushes me to get better, then that's awesome. Yeah. Do you ever, as a singer, do you ever lose your voice? I, I did a lot in my late twenties. I got really into sort of the Melissa cross warming up kind of stuff, you know? Okay. Um, and that was very helpful. Um, and I, so yeah, I, what's I, your, I sort of have it. What's your go-to well, warm up? <laughs> my, yeah. What's, what's, what's my go-to warm up? Yeah. Well, um, I do about 40 minutes of that, like that wow. Melissa Crow okay. sort of thing. So I, Very I, I, do it over the, I do it over the day. So, and okay. I am quite disciplined about it. Like I, I get up in the morning, the first three exercises, I get at it pretty much early lunchtime, three more, you know, and the, to the point where it's like sound check, I, I try to, you know, be ready for you know, to, to kind of go, maybe not a hundred percent, but I feel pretty good by that point. And I've had to do that because I have lost my voice. And it's, as you know, it's one of the most terrifying things in the world, especially when you're playing big shows. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you want to make sure that you're on it. So I'm really big on the, like as a lead singer and a mouthpiece in general, it's tough for me to have vocal rest, but I don't talk to many people throughout the day. I'll just sort of like, you know, keep it low, do my thing, play the show. And then I get a little, little hang time afterwards with everybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel you as a singer. It is, it's uh, terrifying if you're yeah. if you're having maybe like you feel a little under the weather. You haven't slept well. I think sleeping is the number one thing. Is like if you don't Sleeping's get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Like, oh my god, that's it's the worst. And then the anxiety and the worry comes in of like, am I going to do good? If or you know what's going to happen tonight? You know, and that's ah, it's terrible. But like. Uh, Warming up is so critical. Like, absolutely. I, I took, we took like three, me, we meaning my band MXPX, we all took three vocal, like about three vocal lessons from this guy. And he taught us all this stuff, like, like uh, holding your breath backwards. So like you like put all, expel all of your breath. Yeah. Yeah. And then hold your breath. And like that strengthens your diaphragm in a For different sure. way than just regular holding your breath is good too. Like yeah. all of these things, like I don't do these things anymore, but now that I'm thinking about them, I should, you know, especially if you like, like a lot of bands today, you know, are, are starting to go back and play live shows again after a long period of, of uh, 
being sedentary, sedentary. So, well, I tell you, like one of the things that I, that really got me thinking about it is I started exploring, this is maybe kind of weird, but I, I started exploring the sort of your, your canvas of your vocal cords. And, you know, as you kind of transition between your sort of false cords and your normal cords, I certainly learned about when I could, you get to learn about your voice a lot as you play a lot where you start to recognize when a certain part is about to go or it's on its way, you yeah. know, and you kind of shift gears a little bit and maybe you kind of push to those false chords a little bit. And that's been a big savior to me. Um, but also I've been using inner ears for about five or six years now and that I can come out with the same amount of force at 70% of the, of the push and being able to hear myself way better than I used to be able to because of that it means I'm not singing over monitors and I'm sure you've played shitty monitors, you know, for, for years as well as I have too. And, and you do start to understand it's about dialing it back and just hearing yourself and you, maybe your instrument and your little sort of, you know, whether it's the snare drum or the kick drum or whatever you follow. And I just pull everything back and I keep it quiet and then I don't blow things, which is, which is good. Yeah. I think that is huge in years. Ever since I started using in years, it was, it's, it's hard to go back to monitors, you know, totally. maybe one show or something. But after that show, your voice is just so much more taxed. You're like, oh, my yeah. gosh, I was screaming to try totally. to hear myself. Yeah, that's that's all those things are huge. So vocal warm ups being number one, you do like 40 minutes, but throughout the day. Yeah, uh, I, I do like honestly, if I if I had to like choose one thing I do, it's just humming humming yeah. low and just like starting out slow. Like, mm, mm -hmm. wow. That's what the first three are. That's they're all just humming and z, 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 mm. you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, totally, man. It's uh, and I think once you get into the groove and you're doing like 20 shows in a row, I mean, once you hit about, I always say too that I book three shows because um, I book a lot of our stuff. I book three shows and I usually have a day off after that because at that point you feel pretty good. And then your vo voice comes back real good for four and five. And then you're kind of set after that. You know, you have your occasional day offs or Mondays or whatever. Um, but once you get into tour mode, that then maybe I don't have to warm up 40 minutes. Maybe I warm up 10 minutes or something, you know. But like once you, you know, once the muscles train, it's just like anything, right? Right. Um, yeah. You go and jump on a bench after, you know, a year and try to bench 250. It ain't going to happen, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> or ever. <laughs> right. Yeah, probably ever. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. I think once you get in the groove, then it's, then things uh, snap back a little better. Yeah. And, and it's funny, you know, back in the day when we were getting these tours, like we'd get the tour list, we wouldn't question the fact that it's just like, you're know, like, yeah. Oh, I have to sing every night. It was never even a, a thought until <laughs> you're in it and you're like, Oh my God. <laughs> well, the agent's just thinking 10%, right? He's like 10%, 10%. They don't think about days off. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the more I book, the more I make, the more I book, yeah. the more I make. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? That's a good, that's like, that's our school, you know, school of hard knocks, school of punk rock, whatever, uh, road school. It's, it was good. It was good to have, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not going to be the same these days for these kids going out, you know, it's going to be no. different. It'll be a, a, a different crazy experience and, and crazy nonetheless, but yeah. something a little different, but yeah, it's uh, like I book, I book about 20 bands. I have an agency called merit based booking and, and some of them are older bands that have sort of been around the block a few times, but, but some of them are new bands and, and I manage some of them. And it's, it's, that is one of the things I talk about is, you know, it's okay to have a day off. You know, it's okay to take care of yourself, smell the flowers a little bit. You know, I was in Rome like seven times before I even saw the Colosseum and that's bullshit. Like, yes. <laughs> oh my God. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> we, we had a, a tour manager, Tommy rat, uh, yep. you know, Tommy rat, you know yeah. him anyway. He, so he would do that now and again, especially like in, in the later years when, when he was more in charge of our schedule, mm -hmm. he would, uh, one, one day we had a day off in Missouri and we went mm -hmm. to uh, Lake of the Ozarks and and, yep. and just like met this guy that took us on his boat all day. And we just mm -hmm. partied and had a great, went cliff diving. It was just like, Tommy, you're a genius. Yeah. And we did that. It, we did that in Indonesia, had uh, a yeah. couple days off where we were kind of waiting to go for our weekend in Japan or whatever the, you know, the dates lined up. So we had like this like beach resort off season, but it was still warm. Yeah. It's Indonesia and yeah. all basically all to ourselves. And, and it was an experience of a lifetime that you couldn't mm -hmm. really pay for. I mean, you could, but it would be insane. So yeah. anyway, yeah, it's just those, those kinds. Of, I would love to hear 
if you guys have ever done any crazy trips along the way. Yeah, we, I mean, and again, like, and this is probably, I mean, one of the biggest factors why we broke up in 2005 is because we didn't, it was always such a push. Like I remember we split up, we had just took tour to thrive against, we had this great tour in the Eastern Canada and we had one kind of crappy tour in the West. It was just like one of those things where just things weren't lining up and that kind of did it. And I think we just didn't get those kind of recharge days like we should have had, yeah. you know, like one of our biggest tours we ever did, we did 90 shows in a hundred days. And the only reason why we didn't do more shows is because I couldn't find any more basement shows in Georgia or fucking South Carolina or some shit. And it, it's like, it, I think that like when I, I talk to people about regrets, that's one of my biggest regrets is stopping for a second and realizing what I was doing to the band by, because I was the agent as well as the band member. And, and, um, but we did have a few cool things. And, and as you know, warp tour, there was some days off there and sometimes you get in these kind of, fishing trips with bands and stuff like that and um those are always good ones um i do remember with this is a standoff we had a day off in in rome and actually it's funny because that, that was literally like the sixth or seventh time i was there yeah and we actually spent a day looking at the ruins and going to the coliseum and it was just like wow like you know i'm in rome like of course this is crazy you know um and it did a lot for the soul for sure yeah i mean when you're in it you know back talking about like when you're booking and you're playing in the band and you're writing you're doing everything and you're you're the singer you're dealing with fans i mean there's so much you can't it's hard to see the future and go okay the forest through the trees so to speak and yeah. realize okay finances are always a worry they're going to be yeah. a worry but at the end of the day if we take a day off and and, and experience this monument or whatever it is that's yeah. you know you're going through uh it makes such a difference and, and it, but yeah. it's, it's, it's nothing you should really beat yourself up over. It's just something yeah. to learn from, for the future, yeah. which you obviously did going to the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. Um, that reminds me, I, I did the kind of the same thing, you know, I'd been to Italy and Rome many, many times, never took a day to see the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. So finally we were, we were touring in Europe and we went early for a festival and then we, we didn't book any shows for that week. And I flew yeah. my wife out. This was like 10 years ago or more, but flew my wife. Out. Actually, she was pregnant with my first kid. So it was a little less than 10 years ago. And we just went, we went to Rome and we went and cool. did the whole deal. It was amazing. We even got stuck in an elevator, had no cell phone. <laughs> yeah. We were a little scared. It was, it was uh, you know, we, uh, hello, hello. We didn't yeah. speak Italian. <laughs> <Yeah>. Italian. <laughs> <laughs> but uh they got us out they had to come crowbar us out yeah really oh wow you get the full treatment yeah the i think the the only reason we got out s sooner than later which was i'd estimate we were in there maybe 40 to an hour 40 minutes to an hour wow but That's um scary. not not too bad you know as far as getting in stuck stuck in an elevator goes but yeah she said you know i'm pregnant which she was mm -hmm. pregnant and uh they came a little quicker so yeah, <laughs> yeah <no kidding. laughs> you know um one i did an acoustic tour a bunch of years ago in 2012 and i went I, I did a bunch of stuff in europe and i went to japan for usually as you know you kind of do the tokyo nagoya osaka and usually out at least that's what i do with my bands and mm -hmm. the acoustic thing i actually went over for 12 days and so i was going up north in kanazao and sendai and all these little places not really gave me a chance to because i wasn't taking bullet trains i was just getting driven around in a car you could see all the toll roads, you see all the mountains, you see all, you know, and you play these little cafes in front of 50 people. And it was so good. Oh, I'll never forget that. That sounds amazing. But, Go ahead. But yeah. another one is I have a five-year-old now. And the first time he saw us play, actually, he was a year and a half, which you won't remember, but I had him up at Gros Rock. We were on main stage and I had him up for the sound check, kind of showing him, hey, this is what 10,000 people look like. <laughs> and I still have pictures of it. You know, grandma was there. My wife was there. They had done a Europe trip and we sort of met up or whatever. And uh, those are, those are, you know, priceless moments. And I'm hoping, you know, now that I'm able to do more touring and we have a lot of stuff scheduled, the, the next round to Japan, he's going to come, you know, along for that. Cause I want to have him for that. Like, he's got to see, he's starting to get it. He's old enough. Now he gets what rock and roll is and what dad does. And, uh, you know, that, that's going to make this stuff even better to be able to have them there every once in a while. Yeah. It's a trip, you know, from all the way to Calgary and then daddy goes all over the world playing in his rock <laughs> yeah. band. Well, I still feel that way in general. Like it's, um, I still pinch myself because, you know, you're from Bremerton, but 
um, you, so you can kind of relate. We're not mm-hmm. from the big centers, you know, we're not from LA and sometimes you got to go to those places or at least have the connections to sort of get there. And so I still, I, I still kind of pinch myself that I'm able to do this, uh, you know, little band from Calgary that tried. So it, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, um, I'm lucky that I feel, you know, I feel that every day. I feel that that 16 year old kid still a lot. Yeah. And I think that's what, you know, what makes your records feel fresh is cause it, it, it's not like, okay, we're just doing this cause we, this is what we do, but it's yeah, like, thanks for saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I, I really dig the new record by the way, back all the way back to the new record. Uh, Thank you. are you, you guys are probably touring on it, right? You're going to, yeah, I have a hundred shows that I'm book. I'm trying to reschedule right now. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, it's it, three, three Europe tours, a whole line of festivals, Canada stuff. Um, and so, so I'll say 95, 95 shows from last year that I'm, that I'm, I'm currently juggling. And then I've got about 200 other, other shows that I'm juggling for the other roster. What seems to be the, the biggest hurdle with sort of what's happening now with booking, like rescheduling and all that? Like what's the, the hardest bit? Is it the venues? Is it the actual scheduling? Is it the, it comes at you pretty, it comes at you from all angles. And I'm sure as you know, as you know, you talk to management and, and, and agents, it's, you know, you've got your plan A, your plan B, and your plan C. Okay, well, we've got all we can do right now is put rooms on hold and because nobody knows. So we'll see what happens. So then we also got a plan B because you got to get those rooms on hold because a million other bands are trying to get those rooms on hold. And oh, I sure hope that venue is going to be there next year because that's plan C. So um, there is a lot that, <laughs> that kind of goes into this. So I try not to stress about it because I had a, a, a pretty rough three weeks in April last year where I, my whole thing kind of melted down because it was like band, job. An agency all kind of went down within a week and then you start to go well there's nothing i can do all i can do is keep trying and that's all i'm doing right now i've got three weeks on hold in canada i've got a month in november in europe and then i've got april june and august next year in europe two week stints for for that and i just hope that that'll get figured out and then if it does then fall 2022 we will come down to the states for the first time in 15 years sorry we've neglected neg- neglected your country <laughs> <laughs> yeah you guys need to make it back down I mean, it's been too long oh man i really want to get down there again with those fucking work visas man they they kill you they do yes yeah. on all uh, yeah, it's going to be hard internationally i think that's probably uh, so so let's talk about it internationally like is it is uh are promoters going to stop paying for visas for bands well, it's kind of for us as in Canada, like uh, for American bands to come to Canada, it's it's pretty cheap. It's cheaper free. Right. So it's basically just paperwork for us to come down there. It's, we have to sign up for the music, musicians union. We have to get uh, we have to get a permit from Homeland Security through the musician union. We get withheld 30 percent withholding tax for foreign playing. And <laughs> so you get 15. You're welcome, Canada. Thank you. Um, but it's so it's a combination of things so if you know it's tough to make that back in a, in a weekend jaunt down to la or something right so yeah, yeah. You, you have to tend to go for three to four weeks and so that's kind of where we're at right now we're gonna do now that we're able to we're gonna do some more long-term playing um, because you kind of just recoup it throughout all the shows mm. um but it, it it is difficult it is easier for me to play russia than it is the united states and it's three hours from my house wow okay what about say Compared to like Australia, Australia's got some pretty gnarly taxes that bands got to deal with. Have you have you done? They do, that? yeah. And they've got some. Per- yeah, I've actually never been down down there, but I do oh, know the okay. process. Um, and yeah, there's there's visas and taxes and all that stuff too. But generally, they want you to come down because then they get their money. Right. Well, yeah, you can come down, but but it's after you, it's when you make your money they, they're taking a big cut. Uh, yeah. But unless you go through like one of their account, like you got to hire an accountant to like fire this, file this other paperwork. Yeah. Look into that because it's, yeah. it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's worth it. But it's like a little, uh, you got some hoops to jump through, which is always the yeah, case, you, right? You just want to play music, right? Like, yeah. So what <laughs> about Europe? Europe is Europe going to change much, you know, post COVID? Um, it is a, it is a tricky question. I would say that Europe right now is fairly how it always has been. Though we're all every day, I look, I wake up, wake, looking at counts and you know what's going on with borders and stuff. But um, you know, th- there's the UK and Brexit, and that's a whole other ball game now. Um, Brexit, yes. You know, Americans and Canadians have always had to get some f- form of a fairly cheap permit to to tour the UK, but now European bands coming there and vice versa, they're trying to negotiate their whole situation with each country now. So now these this is what's really hard about being a new band. You know, it's tough to go over and make a hundred bucks a show, 
when you've got a $500 visa you now have to pay for that you didn't have to before. And then there's merch stuff where you, if you bring merch across, you got to pay tax on that. And so, you know, we're fortunate that we're in a position that we kind of already know, already do that, you know, we already know the deal, maybe a little bit more, but that's okay. Um, but it is going to be hard for both UK, new UK and new European bands to, to, to go across the channel, which is too bad, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's going to be the biggest bummer. And, and it's probably going to be hard for us bands to, to travel to the UK a little harder than it was. I it, think just more in cost. Cause I mean, you had to get some sort of a permit before, but, um, but again, you, you know, if you're a newer band, that's not making a lot. It's just another another yeah. kick to the teeth when you're just trying to make it work. So what other expenses are going up? Let's, let's get, since we're getting, I mean, I, I, I don't feel like we're being negative. We're just talking about no. the realities of the world. I hate being negative, but yeah, let's talk about what else, what, what else is we got to deal with? Because I want people to somewhat just not assume that everything's hunky dory when they're, they're going to see shows and stuff. Like there's a lot of work that's going to go into, into getting these bands back out on tours and, mm -hmm. and like, I want to hear about it. So, okay. So, um, what else do you think, uh, the costs like airline costs were down way down during COVID, but now yeah. they're going back. Yeah. Up. They're going to spike. I, I think they're going to spike pretty soon. We, uh, thankfully got some of our flights back there that we had sort of out for a while, but, uh, yeah, I, I kind of foresee, especially in the summer, I think that there's going to be some of those airlines that are going to try to recoup, you know, what's, what's been lost over the last little while. Rental cars, of all things, I've mm -hmm. learned are are in high demand right now because of something with a computer system with cars. They can't make them quick enough. And all these rental car companies that ditch their fleet and their staff can't get the cars back. So I was looking at some stuff in the States and it was like three times the cost. Like what? Like, I didn't even think about that, you know? Yeah. So, you know, your, your typical backline van rental companies maybe just let everything collect dust in the backyard, but your national and Hertz and uh, budget may be a little more expensive than they, than they were a year and a half ago. Um, which is a bummer. Yeah. That's a bummer. Gas is up. Everything's up. Um, Gas the, is up. The uh, probably insurance. I wonder what that's going to look like, or can you even get it on certain things? You know, because I worry about, cause I I've seen that in the, in the UK where some of the reasons why some of the festivals aren't going I mean, they do have higher COVID numbers now, so that's putting a kink in things. But I've always wondered that, like, when you know, what point are the insurance companies going to say we can't insure these festivals, um, you know, without knowing how things are going to go or without vaccination cards or you know, I uh, and I don't have answers to that. Yeah. I just you know, I sit and wait, and it's it's a I book every show I book. It's it's a conversation, and it hasn't come up, but I've seen it where people are in the UK are saying, you know, you know, this festival got pushed to the fall because there was no way that we were going to get insured for the summer. Right, right. So what's, what's weird is the U.S. for the most part is is open. Uh, most states, I think, I, honestly, I haven't heard any of any states that have uh, kept the lockdown going. But um, even yeah, you're going for it. Yeah, even Washington State is completely open now. Yeah. Um, so it feels like normal to, to us mm -hmm. in the U.S., but then isn't Canada still kind of has some restrictions on on there? Yeah. So we never really had like a lockdown, but we've had various levels of restrictions. So um, we are vaccinating at quite a bit quicker rate recently compared to the U.S. And so they kind of have this benchmark of 75 percent sort of double vaxxed that they're hoping to have by the end of July. And if that's the case then it's just a numbers game and, and our numbers have gone down quite a bit. I, I watch the States a lot and, you know, in States that don't have high vaccination rates, they're having big surges and they're worried about hospitals getting overwhelmed again. And it, it's too bad because there was a really good trajectory for the, for the country, but yeah, you've thrown the doors open and um, I guess we'll see how it goes. But <laughs> up, up here, it's been okay. Like it's um, what kind of restrictions do you have right now? We don't. No in, restrictions in Al, right I'm, now. In Alberta, I'm in conservative central in Alberta here, so we've we we had a Cal, we have the Calgary Stampede, Stampede on right now, the, yeah. big, the big yeehaw. So they've uh, they've opened it up for that. So we'll we'll see how it goes, and, and may, you know maybe nothing will happen. But we have really low numbers right now and high vaccination rates, re relatively speaking. But um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. My big thing is I don't want things to open up too quickly over the summer because I want it. I want tours to happen in the fall, so I don't want there to be a be a big you know the br brakes put on again in the fall because you know, shit's fucked up from the summer 
of us getting a little too over the top with ourselves. But, you know, all you can do is just um, do what you can do. <laughs> How yeah. can I say that diplomatically? You know? <laughs> yeah, you're, that's very try diplomatic. Your, try to encourage your friends to do what they should probably do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> do what you should do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's it's uh, it, it is funny because the news. Not that I'm really watching the news, but you you get an yeah. idea if you pay attention to any social media of what's trending and what's what the big news stories are. You know, like I don't know if you yeah. saw that fireball in the middle of the the Gulf of Mexico. Sure did. <laughs> But so the news hasn't been, you know, you you hear, oh, Delta variants or something. But, like, yeah. you don't really hear much about breakouts happening anymore and, and this and that. It's more about just whatever else is happening in the world. I don't even yeah. know. But. Yeah, they've really kind of, like, squashed it. Um, you know, when you look at how things are going in Florida and Missouri, it's, it's, it's not going very good right now. And ultimately, I just want to see people be okay. I don't want unfortunately the whole idea with vaccines and this whole thing has become quite politicized and, and very much so in the States. And, um, it's, it's, it's hard for me to watch. I, it, it, I just feel bad. You know, I have a lot of empathy for that. You know, you kind of get, you have your two sides of the fence and they, they pick their channel of news and, and that's usually what they go with. And, and it's about public health and it's about common sense. And sometimes that gets diluted a little bit when you've got your choice of channel, pushing you in, in the direction that, that they want to. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know anymore to be honest. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I, you know, and I'm, I'm a pretty like, you know, I, I don't, I don't like to put it out there that much because I don't want to get in the middle of it. And I don't want to fucking, I don't want to have people not like my band because we all got our vaccines, but I don't care anymore. You know, I, <laughs> we, we all have to tour. And we we're all completely vaccinated, and I'm and I'm happy to say that, and I'm and I'm proud of modern medicine to make that happen. So now we can actually go out and do these kind of things. And uh, if you don't want to, then fuck it. I don't. You know, nothing I can say. But you know, it it will be increasingly harder for people that want to travel around the world because, you know, it's like when you go to South America. I go to Venezuela. I need yellow fever, or I need you know typhoid or whatever. That's a non-negotiable. Mm-hmm. So if that's where this is going you know, to tour the world, then you either go or you don't. I don't know. The health minister of Tennessee, the state of Tennessee in the U.S., uh, just recently said, you know, they made a new rule that says uh, says that you can't, you can't, they don't want any vaccines, any vaccines, not just the COVID vaccine, but Mm -hmm. they, they, they don't want to promote, I think it's actually like underage, but still like, uh, polio vaccine, uh, measles, yeah. measles, things like that. Um, they're saying no to all those. So like, it's like the legit conspiracy theory, anti, anti-vaxxer kind of dude. That's part of like in charge of the government. That's, that's gonna, yeah. gonna like decide public health for people in that state. But isn't that, isn't that funny that they're all vaccinated to polio and smallpox and, you know, our generation, mm-hmm hasn't seen this as much but our parents generation sure remembers taking that sugar cube with the medicine when they were kids and it was a non-negotiable you take your medicine and you don't get polio and you don't die or like have your legs maimed mauled, or, right yeah, like whatever it is. you know and so that's scary and that's sad i think um because it's not really based on any evidence it's just based on feeling and um when it comes to health I don't, I don't know if feeling is the best way to maybe, I don't know if your gut feeling should supersede um, people that are doing this for a, for a living and have been done, doing this for decades. Right. This is a weird one though with COVID because it's really dangerous to some people, but then some people yeah. like literally don't feel anything and don't get sick. And so it's, it's true. just hard for it, it's plenty a big of people. Topic. Yeah. It's, it's hard for people it, to grasp it. It's a big topic. And you know, and it's uh, it's tough again. It's tough to just kind of jump out there and form an opinion on things and have a strong opinion on things because there is everybody's different. Um, I've seen people that have gotten COVID and still can't taste properly a year later. Um, there's people, you know, we've had almost three thousand people die in Alberta because of this. You know, mm-hmm. so you know, also scares me that you know my age group when we 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 had we were offered AstraZeneca, so we all got that for our first shot. And then, of course, all the blood clot thing came up. And then it was like, okay, well, let's get Pfizer. So now we're mixing drugs, you know. But at the end of the day, it's like, 
That's weird, right? Like what? Well, I, well, it's weird to you because you guys had a good supply, but we were we were at the point where it was, you know, s- stick a saline thing in my arm, just get something going here because right. we were really far behind for a long time. So, you know, millions of Canadians mixed just like that. And well, I'm still standing here. So ho- hopefully I can say that two years from now in the long term, I'm still standing here after the mix. But yeah, um, you're right. You know, the, and there's always it's difficult when new evidence comes out. And and I mean, that's science, right? It's just a it's an ongoing discovery. But um, you, you, I know why people are scared, because it is a bit unknown. And uh I do, uh, I do get it. And for a lot of people that are immune compromised, maybe they can't take it, you know? Yeah. Right. A lot of different reasons. I just feel like, uh, you know, as long as there's a hope of a uh, return to some sort of normalcy, you know, it's not going to be the same as it was ever, you no. know, it's going to be different, but, <laughs> but, uh, people do want to see shows. People want to get out and they want to, you know, meet up with their friends in bars and yeah. that's happening definitely in the U.S. And I think it's a good thing, you know, uh, but we still have to pay attention to to what's going on around us, you know. And, and Yeah, it's, it's tricky. Like, you know, it's it's hard not seeing my family and my friends and stuff like that. It's uh, you want to see that you want to play shows. And that's ultimately all I want. I want people to be able to to go out and do things and live their lives safely. And so, um, you know, that's kind of why we've made the decisions that we have. And also because, you know, for a band like ourselves, we have to you know, we've got to be prepared to, to go to several different countries and, and, uh, and all the exposure and stuff that, that potentially could come because of that. I don't want to get sick in Germany or, you know, Japan and be stuck in a hospital for two weeks. Yeah. What's going to be, could still happen anyways. <laughs> it could always happen. Right. <laughs> what What's going to be your, your first, uh, show back. Do you know? Ottawa. We're playing Ottawa and then we're playing, uh, Pusa Fest. Uh, we're headlining there, um, uh, at the end of September. Awesome. And so fing- fingers crossed. <laughs> yes. Yes. End of September. Yeah. I mean, uh, is, uh, is there any other festivals that you know of that have already even happened in Canada or, or is everything waiting till September in Canada? Um, there might be sort of regional like folk fest kind of stuff where it's outside and really far apart. I, I don't know. Um, this will be one of the, for punk stuff, this will probably be one of the, most of the summer stuff's canceled. Yeah. Um, I think September will be that. And people are kind of like, it, it's booked right now. It, it's an indoor sort of festival. There's multi venues and it's booked at 25% capacity because that's where they think that's where things are right now. They don't want to oversell tickets. Right. Mm-hmm. So the next step is to hopefully see restrictions loosen up enough to this is in Ontario and Quebec, not where I'm from. We're, we're open for business, but uh, in Ontario, Quebec, hopefully we'll get to that 50% and then they'll continue on down the line. And hopefully by the end of September, if things are looking good, it'll be 100% capacity. Wouldn't you just uh, just book shows in the open states or the open provinces or provinces of Canada? Instead of going to Ottawa until, you know, until they're 100 Well, I mean, we got asked to do the festival. So we sort of, we, we wanted to get things going around then. So we've got 10 shows booked around that. And then in, in the West, BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, they sort of foresee that by the end of July, things will be mostly open. So we're, again, you know, kicking the can, hopefully, that this one will, will take. Yeah, for sure. All right. So after that, like, what's, what's after September? I got um, a month booked in Europe, uh, three weeks in Europe, and one week in the UK. People are excited, I'm sure. You know, people are chomping at the bit. I'm sure excited. Yeah. <laughs> I so, am nervous because I don't want to shell out more flights for another thing to get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, then if that doesn't work out, then we'll sh- we'll push those dates to April next year and um, and just extend the uh, the tour that we were doing over there. Yeah. Awesome. That's going to be great. So do, do, are there bands playing in Calgary like this week for, for Stampede? There's some, yeah, some, there is. We've got an outdoor stage at the, uh, the Stampede, like just like rock bands and stuff, yeah. you know, uh, local shows. Yeah. There's a few things kind of going on. Um, I don't think any like big sellout bands kind of thing, like in terms of being able to sell out venues, I think mm-hmm. it's like, well, we have a 200 cap room. They'll bring 50 people. So we'll naturally sell Sure, you know, have sure. Your, have your dis- it's like you know. I always say, like, yeah, you know, we've been we've been socially distancing, you know, all through the '90s because we couldn't sell out a venue until you know <laughs> 2000. But um, yeah, well, in in Waco, Texas, you know, I share time between the two, but uh, mm-hmm. they have a venue called the Backyard, and 
a lot of country shows. Bowling for Soup plays there now and again. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, Snoop Dogg is is playing there. A uh, bunch of like big acts are like playing there because Texas is open, you know. So like, yeah. so all these people from California are going to come and hit some shows there. P- the venues they normally would never play. Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of traditionally a, a country venue with some rock mm-hmm. bands now and again, you know, that are like Texas rock bands. But uh, so it's it's funny to see that it's just like they're just going where they're where they're where they're able real, to able to exactly. Yeah, yeah, I saw that even with that. What was it? Punk in the Park. They had uh, in California. They weren't going to have the festival till November, but I think it happened in May in Arizona, Arizona. Yeah. And we were like, Whoa, like, but you know, it went off and who knows how it, I'm, I'm sure it did great. And there you go. So, yeah, I think it did fine. Uh, punk, yeah. punk and Drublick is, is back about to do yep. some shows. So, I mean, it's, it's the, but it's the festivals. It's like, everybody's doing the festivals first, which is smart Yeah, and uh, see how it goes. And, and I just, I just can't wait to like see Okay, are people all over each other? I mean, there's yeah. there's going to be a few people that are going to be like, I don't care. Let's get sweaty. Let's get gross. Yep. Totally. Yeah. Remember, yeah, I mean. Remember the COVID yeah. parties? The yeah. r- rumored COVID parties? I don't know if they were yeah. a real thing or just a <laughs> media. Dude, it's, yeah, it, it's a funny thing because, like, you know, I've been, as yourself, you've sort of been sort of, this has been an interesting year and a half and it does sort of take a while to kind of <clears throat> kick the rust off, you know, but ultimately yeah. like as careful as we've been and as careful as I want, you know, to be, I want to get out there and rip again. Yeah. So what, where are a, a, not necessarily touring, but what are a few of your favorite cities in the world? Tokyo is always awesome. I would have figured that since you were talking about that tour was so great. Tokyo yeah, is Tokyo. always awesome. It's just, it feels safe for one. You don't feel like you have yeah. to worry about anything. And then, and then just everything about it is so different than the Western yeah. culture. Yeah, it's a trip. The, the, yeah, it's just sort of this 2,000-year-old culture that you sort of see, and then right next door, it's like Blade Runner. Like, it's just, it's insane. Yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah. I love, we we, uh, we play in, in Colombia quite often. We, we do, uh, we just did this festival there in Medellin, and it was awesome. Bogota is great. Beautiful. South America. Is, yeah. What's that? Uh, beautiful, beautiful city. Yeah. Medellin especially is just insane. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I really like South America. I like I like a little bit of excitement to the tours, and and South America provides that. Not as so. safe, not as safe there. Yeah, <laughs> you got to pay attention. We, to we you know, we on. we went to Venezuela in '03, and that was that was exciting. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to tour there now. Yeah, but um, yeah. you know, Brazil, we'd gone a couple times in Chile and Peru, and I I really love Argentina. I, Buenos Aires is uh, my wife and I have spent a week down there, and I love just walking around there. And we, we were working on our Spanish and. Those are those are good spots, but um, yeah, there's lots great of good city. venues. I love playing in lots of great cities. Yeah, I love Buenos Aires is awesome. Although they don't have a very good uh, stringent dog shit policy. No, they just, they just no, you got to watch yourself. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> all over the sidewalk, everywhere. Yeah, head down. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but it's a great city, great food, amazing. Yeah, great crowds. Love it. Um, yeah. I was trying to think like back to Russia. I mean, you've obviously, mm-hmm. you, have you guys played out there quite a bit? Not with Belvedere. We did this as a standoff there and I'm hoping we can get back to Moscow. You guys and would know, kill in Moscow with uh, Moscow is Belvedere. so, it's so rad. Like I, I had a really good time uh, in junior high. I remember studying the, like part of social studies. We had like a Russia sort of, you know, unit or whatever. And then you get to Moscow and you you look and you're like, there's the church, there's Lenin's tomb. There's, you know, the Kremlin and it's mm. all just kind of, you just have to do a 360 in the middle. You know, it's awesome. Um, very cool. Huge city. I had no idea how, how many people there were there. It's crazy. Um, and then St. Petersburg was beautiful. And we played a few little sort of satellite cities, Tula and Istra uh, mm-hmm. in Moscow and took the train in and, you know, like from, from Finland and really had a blast. And the shows were great, like crazy crowds, crazy merch. It was, it was really good. Awesome. Awesome. That's rad. I mean, it, yeah, we we've played Tula and Vista, all, all that as well. Istra, not Vista. Istra, yeah, uh, yeah. We've played those weird places, and we played this strip club one mm-hmm. time. <laughs> I don't know if you probably yeah. played it. You probably played it. The the stage was super tall. I don't know. It was in either Istra or one of those one of those towns. But uh, yeah, I don't. I remember we played kind of like a squat. I think in one of them. And, was it like uh, a squat that used to be a theater? And downstairs they had a. a no, it was like a studio. traditional like. Like an squat. actual squad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
we played this place in one of those towns. It was just like you, you felt instantly like you're in this like B movie. This, this yeah. weird like there's people with machine guns just gonna come start shooting at any second, but that doesn't happen. Everybody's cool. But uh, downstairs there was this like recording <laughs> studio, and uh, the walls were made of beer like beer boxes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but yeah, this the show was insane. <laughs> I, I remember we played this show in Bratislava once and, and, and uh, it was fun. And, and we were kind of hanging out and we were, we were staying in this hostel that night, but it seemed real sketchy. Like no one was around. It was really like, you could hear the water tap, you know, the water bouncing off the pipes and stuff, you know, pretty quiet. And we're like, man, this feels just like that movie hostel. And we're like, where did that take place? And we're like, Bratislava. And everyone's like, oh, ah. <laughs> yeah. Oh we my God. It. We made it through the night. <laughs> yeah. No, that movie was insane. I was thinking the whole time when I watched that movie of like, oh my gosh, we've been in some sketch places. Yeah. Don't ever trust a weird, nice, uh, an overly nice stranger, right? Yeah. <laughs> or like super point. hot chicks. Yeah. <laughs> oh my yeah. God. That's yeah. I'm trying to think of some other good spots like Ravenna in Italy. Is, uh, you you spent time in Italy. Ravenna is awesome. I love the whole mm -hmm. Adriatic coast. Um, yeah, yeah, it's Italy's fun. I've yeah. been down to the bottom of the boot there in Lamezia Terme, and you can basically see Sicily from down there. And it's a it's a trip. Just all the all these places are fun. Have you uh, had the chance to hit Greece? We played Athens. We did what? We flew in. 14 hours, played the show, and left. <laughs> oh no! You didn't see yeah, the missed, the Acropolis. Yeah, we 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 had a day off in Greece for that reason. We just were like, let's let's take a day off on the day after, and it was amazing just walking around all those white buildings and yeah. But uh, sorry, I don't mean to rub it in, but no, you'll get no, there. You get there. No, next, my parents next went. They did a Greece trip recently, and and yeah, they rubbed it in pretty good. They got to see some good stuff. <laughs> good times. I mean, there's places that I still want to go. I haven't been South Africa. Uh, there's yep. been a couple times we almost you know made it happen and just fell apart or whatever i don't know but yeah we know. had as we were supposed to go to south africa i think i think we were talking about it in 2000 and of course 9 11 happened and i remember strung out was supposed to go and they actually had their tour canceled around that time and it, we just kind of you know and then it kind of kind of got tricky to you know promoters there wasn't as many promoters at the time i think and yeah we just never had the chance to go back but yeah there's you know, China, I've been talking to some promoters there for probably 15 years about going there, but it's just always the time and, you know, yeah. cost and all that stuff. So yeah, I would no, definitely like to take a little bit off a Japan tour and maybe see some more stuff of South South Asia for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would say we've only been to Japan or sorry, Japan a bunch of times, but uh, China once and it was uh -huh. it was a great experience. It was fun. Uh, the shows were cool. The shows were kind of small. I mean, because it was our first time, but uh, mm -hmm. this was years ago and I would say it was weird. It was in the MySpace days and they, yeah. they would not allow, like I couldn't check MySpace in, in China yeah. wherever I was, which was, I was like, Whoa, that's, that's crazy. And uh, I remember, I remember talking to guys there in China about like that did distro and mm -hmm. they were doing distro for epitaph and stuff like that. But they had to, every CD had to get inspected of its lyrical content and all that stuff. There was a, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's pretty uh they don't allow any dissident in you know opinions on china anything that looks yeah. makes them look bad and they're yeah. very very they take it very seriously yeah yeah so would love to go for sure yeah absolutely don't say anything bad about china and you're good yeah, I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's the weird thing too i don't want to bring this maybe i shouldn't bring this up on your your episode but just the fact that they have people under their thumb like people that like the nba and the and all, uh, Disney and, and these Apple for, for, for one, you know, um, Apple doesn't, the, the only time they kind of break their, their normal privacy rules and laws are mm -hmm. for China because China's like, yeah. if you want to do business with us, you have to have the cloud in our country because we're going to look at everything in the cloud. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I ain't gonna say nothing because I don't want anybody else coming after me. I'm a I'm already pissed off enough people being a booking agent, so I think I'll just leave it at that. I bet, I bet. I'll I'll say it for both of us, or just I'll say <laughs> it for myself that I think it's weird, and uh, if that means uh, they don't let me in, well, we'll 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 talk about it. Well, that. you had your time. I had my time. I went, and the the duck was amazing. The Peking duck <laughs> it was it was Chef's kiss. Mwah. Yeah, Chef kiss. Great job. Yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, you know, I was just actually I was actually talking to my buddy uh, last night. He's he's living. He's American. He's from here, and he uh, he's living in South Korea and mm. Seoul. And and he yeah. started started living there, being a teacher, speak uh, teaching English and. And he met his wife there, and now they're having a kid. And, and I was asking him about North Korea. I was like, what, what do you guys think about North Korea over there? And he's like, oh, we're pretty much just like, they're like kooky neighbors from the north, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't think that's he really sim- knew. <laughs> no, that's, that's simplifying it, but yeah. Yeah, it is, it is. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, the reason I even bring it up is it's just, it's fascinating. It's, t- it's devastating, you know, for the people that, that have to endure the, the struggle and hardship. But... Yeah. It's fascinating just that in in this present day, whole governments, whole countries, whole populations can be controlled, you know. And I guess, you know, there's a lot of people out there listening right now. Well, people are being controlled right now in the U.S. Yeah. Yes, yes, people are. Yes, the government has a long history of mind control and using But we at, least, at least we and, sort of live in a Truman show, you know, or at least we're allowed to go do our day to day, right? Like, that <laughs> is the big difference is in America, you, you really get a lot of leeway. I mean, there's things yeah. you can't do eventually, but we can say a lot and we can do whatever we want. Mm-hmm. And we can we can uh, we can pursue our own happiness until it until you can't. But yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I still feel like we're we're we got a, a pretty great deal over here. Um, yeah, we were, we were dealt a, a good uh, deck of cards for sure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But I mean, g- going back to your record, what's what's what are some of the themes? You know, you guys traditionally kind of talk about some serious themes uh, on songs. So what is mm-hmm. this new record? What are you guys talking about? Hindsight is the sixth sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it does cover quite a few different topics. There is some personal stuff there, mental health stuff. You know, I don't, I don't want to say feeling suicidal, but feeling really down on yourself, like you just never, mm-hmm. you know, never really um, measure up. I think there there is a song called The Ides that I really did kind of dig into that a little bit. Um, I write a lot of songs at three o'clock in the morning, so I'm able to tap into sort of those heightened feelings, you know, when I'm not chasing a five-year-old around during the daytime. Um, so that, you know, that is somewhat serious. I I do talk a lot about, you know, the working class and the wealth, wealth gap between, you know, the, the, the upper echelon of rich, I'm not talking the 1%, I'm talking the the Mm 0.1% and this growing disparity of, uh, disparity of, you know, people are getting richer through the pandemic, but people can, are, are getting their houses foreclosed on, you know, just, um, so I do talk a little bit about that and I share my personal feelings on that and it's not preachy, but it is you know, it is important to me as somebody who's in his mid forties that is watching my, my son and the younger generation grow up. I, I want things to be better for them than they were for people in our generation. And there's a little bit of climate stuff and just sort of generally like taking care of yourself, your friends and family and the world around you. Um, yeah, we, it, I definitely top, you know, sort of tip on a few different topics for sure that are more serious than maybe some of the earlier um, stuff that we did. Yeah, I think it's great. Uh, you know, it seems like punk rock has sort of morphed into a more of a self-help vibe. And, and I say I include myself in that. Mm-hmm. You know, I write a lot of songs that are breaking things down, feelings, and then trying to build build it back up, you know, find the brighter side, find the positive at yeah. the end of the day. But like... But pinpointing some some hurt, pinpointing something that sure. didn't go right, you know, some failures, and and maybe that's just a, a general cultural shift that's happened over the years, and it's not just punk rock; it could be more than punk rock. But it does feel like you know the difference. I mean, the only thing I can think of back in the day, there's one song, Descendants Pep Talk. You know, that's that's kind of self helpy, you know, or whatever. Yeah. You know, the Descendants yeah. were a self helpy kind of band, but most mm-hmm. of the other bands were just. The other way around, a little bit different, you know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I'm literally don't know what I mean by bringing that up. I just kind of thought of it, but no, you 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 bring a good point, and like you know, I I've listened to your your catalog through the years, and I and I see an evolution in that too. And you, you think differently when you're 20, you know, than when you do when you're 40. And when we were 19 and 20, there wasn't this sort of vast catalog of information at our at our fingertips at all time too. You know, a lot of the stuff was hearsay, and what did this person say, and what's that country like? I don't know. This guy went there 10 years ago. Talk to him. Like it, you know, now you know everything good or bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so you, you make that choice. Do I, do I, do I contribute and make something of value 
or do I just keep singing about, you know, wrestling or something like that, that, you know, may mean something to somebody, but doesn't mean anything to me now. And so I, you know, I, I do take, I don't want to just pump out records with nothing to say and the, or the same things I want to uh, challenge myself and I want to do it in a way that doesn't alienate people. Like I'm not going to sit there being like, stop listening to Fox news. You fucking idiots. Like you're not going to get anywhere with that. If you want to have your music accessible and your lyrics open to many people, telling them things like that is not going to work, but maybe you can give them, maybe you can deliver it in a way where like, well, actually, you know, even though we are not on the same side of the political spectrum, I understand what you're talking about, or it means something to me that may not mean something to you. And if you can do that, I think that's special. And I try, you know, I'm not saying I succeed, but I, I try to, to be better and to, to, um, to think about that. Think about how other people think. I think it's great. I think I love that, that vibe. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's important to just stay open, you know, yeah. as a songwriter to, to, you know, not, thinking I need to write about this because my band's always written about this, you know, to yeah. be open to what's happening now in your life. And, and that's hard. It's hard, but as a songwriter, it's your job. So thanks for doing mm -hmm. it for us. And you t like, you know, I think you understand that too, where you talk, you talk about, you know, bringing it all together and, and creating hope for people. And there's so much polarization in the world. Isn't it great to have that kind of stuff, or at least people trying to, to do that where we can kind of maybe pull people a little bit together. Um, mm -hmm. And, give them things to talk about. Hopefully, uh, you know, whether they agree or with it or not, but at least give them something to talk about. Absolutely. And I, I, just like you, I like a good pissed off song now and again, or a rant song about this and that. But after a while, I want something positive at to, yeah. something uplifting at the end of the day, something to make me feel good. And, and I see people posting, you know, motivational type posts online, and they'll put like, a song behind it, you know, and, and it feels good when they use your song in that way. Cause you're like, okay, you're, you're bringing, you're bringing some positivity to the world. Not just, not just sitting in your room doing, being negative, clack, clacking the keyboard, yeah. insulting people because they have a different opinion. So yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah. Well, I like this conversation in general. We've kind of gone on a bit of a roller coaster. You know, there was some things there that we kind of got into that were serious and negative, but also, all, not negative, but just kind of took it for a bit of a spin. But but I think you know we're complex human beings, and we and we feel different things at different times, and we feel different about different things. And I think that I'm glad we talked we we touched on a lot of topics. You know, ultimately, um, what I love about punk rock and the scene is that it's generally empathetic, and it wants people to be okay, and it wants our scene to be okay. And and I I just absolutely love it. I feel like the scene is there for us, and we're there for the scene. You know what I. I haven't thought about that recently, but hearing you say it kind of clicked for me in a lot of ways of, of maybe that's why I love punk rock so much is because I've always been empathetic, probably too much in some ways, not enough in others, yeah. but, but maybe that's part of why I love punk rock so much is I, I feel comfortable with, with people that love punk rock. I always yeah. do. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's not it's not a haircut. It's a it's a feeling and it's a, and it's a way of doing things and it's not necessarily a way of thinking about things, but it's definitely it's a vibe. It's a it's a lifestyle. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's a lifer. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, for being on Steve Rawls. Everybody, where can people find the new record? Find, you know, follow you on socials, that kind of thing. Can you can you rattle off some info? Yeah, you can definitely find Belvedere at Belvedere Band on uh, on Facebook. Uh, we've got a Belvedere Band official on Instagram. You can find our records at Thousand Islands Records out of Quebec. We have distro in the States and Canada. Lockjaw Records in the UK and EU. And uh, everything else can be found on Spotify and all the, um, you know, Apple and all the other streaming if we can't find a physical copy for you. But we hope that um, we'll be touring to a town near you and we can actually hand it to you. Awesome. Awesome. Dude, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. I had a great, a great time talking to you. Thank you. Me too, Mike. Thanks a lot. This was great. All right. Thanks, Steve. Be well. Take care.